Next, almost three years after the COVID pandemic began, the U.S. healthcare system is still struggling with shortages of medicine and supplies. Dr. Masha Dabir is an emergency physician and senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, and she tells Hari Sridhavasan what's behind this crisis and how to solve it. Christian, thanks. Dr. Masha Dabir, thanks so much for joining us. Um, over the past few weeks, we've seen lots of headlines of different types of medications and drugs that are in short supply. And I want to ask, as an ER doc, are you seeing the same thing on the ground or what are you seeing? Yes, Harry, you're touching on a really critical issue that is not new for hospitals and health systems. So over the course of the years, even before the pandemic, we experienced various shortages, including in, in uh, IV fluids and also cancer medications. The reason why currently the issue is highlighted in the way that it is and brought a lot of attention to is that it involved children and some of the medications that are important for the care of children, including amoxicillin, which treats various infections and also albuterol for the treatment of asthma. And this is happening all at the same time as having spikes in RSV infections and COVID and influenza. So it's a particularly sensitive time to be experiencing these shortages. Help me understand the direct impact on patients if albuterol or Adderall or amoxicillin is not available. What, what is the health concern here? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, starting with albuterol. So as you all know, uh, there's a spike in RSV cases, influenza and COVID. And both in children and adults, uh, albuterol is a medicine for asthma. And any asthmatic who is infected with any of these viruses may experience an exacerbation of their asthma and they will really need their albuterol. And if not treated appropriately, asthma can be life-threatening. Uh, so that's one problem. Amoxicillin is an antibiotic that's used for the treatment of bacterial infections in both children and adults. And particularly if in addition to these viruses that are now going around, someone has a bacterial infection and needs amoxicillin, because it is so effective against so many different types of bacterial infections, it can potentially cause issues as far as patients' inability, because it's relatively inexpensive, patients may not be able to get a, a substitute antibiotic because they can't afford it or insurance is not paying for it, or that the treatment of their, um, you know, their in a, in a bacterial infection may get delayed. So g give me an example of something that might be happening at your hospital right now or other hospitals about what type of a patient is coming in and what's short and what's happening to them? Uh, you know, I, I will speak to a couple of, of actually the issues that we faced, um, you know, uh, recently, actually. So uh, a shortage of morphine, which is an important uh, you know, IV administered uh, drug that is uh, is important for pain control. And, and particularly in the pediatric population or pregnancy, it's one of the two go medicines for acute illness and, 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 and pain that we administer to patients. And if we're not able to, to give that medicine or uh, the times when we've had IV fluid for, uh, shortages, uh, you know, you don't want to be in the acute care setting like emergency department and have to think twice about ordering IV fluids for patients who need it. So these have real, real life consequences for people, um, whether it is pain management or ensuring that you can give IV fluids to a patient who's in septic shock. Uh, you know, these are these potentially can affect patient outcomes and how well they do um, uh, from their illness. So why are these shortages happening, especially if we're talking about antibiotics that, you know, uh, some of which are completely off patent now and there are generic versions, they should be available pretty far and wide in the United States? It's usually a function of two, two issues, either uh, decreased supply or increased demand. Yeah. So I think that we're at a juncture right now where we're experiencing both. So given the increase in, in respiratory illnesses, both in children and in adults, amoxicillin is being used, uh, particularly if there's a bacterial infection in addition to a viral infection like RSV and influenza. And also, if there's any kind of disruption in, in getting the medication to these hospitals and health systems, so that last mile, and getting these medications to the pharmacy, that also will impact folks getting the medications they need. So what's the, where is the kind of kink in the supply chain here? 
So the supply chain is really could, could be either the production of the medicine. So if there's an issue with the facility, if they have shortages in the components uh, of what goes into the medication, for example, amoxicillin, or that if the actual company or, or uh, the location where uh, the medication is made, if there's issues of staffing or labor shortages or any other issues that, that slows down production at the site, then uh, you're going to experience it as, as, a, as a user end user or patient. You know, you are on a, uh, a very special committee, the National uh, Academy of Science, Engineering, Medicine, and you issued a report uh, earlier this year on the security of America's product supply chain. And I just want to uh, quote a paragraph here. Over the past several decades, medical product supply chain disruptions and shortages have plagued the U.S. healthcare system, putting the lives of Americans at risk, costing medical facilities millions of dollars per year, and threatening the clinical research enterprise. I mean, this is not something new. As you said, we've had these sort of decades-long problems. Why aren't these problems being fixed? Who's sort of responsible for getting that fix? So a lot of the issues that we're facing right now and have historically faced is due to lack of transparency. So the companies that make these medications are not obligated to report uh, who, where they get the ingredients from, who is the primary supplier, and where they're even made. So in the setting of this lack of transparency and not really holding these companies accountable, uh, then it's hard to predict when there's going to be a shortage in any of these medications. So a lack of ability to know that, that there is a potential shortage is going to make it very difficult to come up with strategies to mitigate and come up with solutions. And that is why one of the most important policy changes that we can make in the U.S. is incentivizing and disincentivizing manufacturers of, of uh, medicines and medical equipment to share more information about their ingredients and where things are made and where their, their products are made. And that that kind of transparency ultimately can lend itself to surveillance of, of uh, supply chain issues so that you can mitigate and advance and implement strategies. I think when people read in the newspapers that there are shortage of, shortages of critical medicines, they're doubly shocked that it's happening in the United States, where not only do we have such wide range of access to medications and medical facilities and doctors, but also the amount of money that we all spend on healthcare. So is there a structural fix that's necessary? I think there's multiple fixes that are necessary. Um, you know, uh, yes, I think that the average end user of any of these medications would be shocked to know that we have any shortages here. But part of the issue is that a lot of these medications are made abroad and imported. So China is a big producer, India, there's others. So that's that's one part of the problem. Uh, so and also uh, the fact that um, uh, again uh, we rely on foreign producers. If there's any any kind of bottleneck in the production of these uh, these uh, medicines overseas and also medical equipment, so it's not just medicines, then that's going to cause problems and issues and delays in getting the medications that we need and shortages. And ultimately, sometimes doctors and health systems have had to resort to using alternates. And sometimes the alternates are not as effective or they can have um, uh, uh, you know unforeseen consequences for patients who use them. Is this something, given that some of the ingredients for these medications that are in short supply today are coming from overseas. How long would it take for the United States to bring the manufacturing back for some of at least the incredibly important ones that we're short on? Yeah, so I think you're referring to onshoring, so you know, production of, of medicines here in the United States, which certainly is part of the toolkit of strategies that we need to think about thinking forward and moving forward. However, you know, it is not really kind of the ultimate solution because you have to think about, uh, you know, the, the, the degree of demand uh, and, and, the, and the time sensitivity of, of getting these medicines uh, to the end user. Um, so, you know, as part of, again, a toolkit of various strategies, uh, including diversifying um, uh, manufacturers abroad and, and ensuring that we have options of bringing in medicines that we need. Also, yes, I think onshoring is part of the solution, but not the entire solution. Do you think that we start with medicines that are kind of the most, uh, well, I guess lack of that medicine would be the most life-threatening and then kind of work our way 
down the chain? Or how do you prioritize where to start trying to make some of these changes? Yeah, I think that it's a, it's a challenging issue because uh, just as you point out, there's certain, certain products like IV fluids that are critical to the care of many sick patients, similar with antibiotics or albuterol, which you know, you know, is important for asthma and many other very common lung diseases. So I think it makes sense to start with, with medicines that are used more commonly and for apply to a wider population or the whole population when they get sick. But at the end of the day, we, we also can't ignore those medicines that really are pertinent to a smaller, you know, proportion of the population or for rare conditions. Uh, but I think starting off with, with the more med uh, common medicines and equipment that, that are critical in many conditions uh, certainly makes sense. You know, I wonder, the past couple of years brought to sharp relief all of the different types of things that we are dependent on. We learned the hard way that it doesn't hurt to save a little bit for a rainy day. And I wonder, have you seen any big changes like that? So these are all excellent questions. Typically, health systems in the U.S. don't plan that far ahead because the return on investment for them is low. So imagine that they have to prepare for an incident or the next public health emergency that may never arrive. So, I mean, the perfect example also is on a day-to-day -day basis, many health systems, even for staffing, they, they, they don't plan ahead of time. They really, really kind of determine on a day-to-day -day basis or maybe even 72-hour basis at best, how much nursing staff they need. So, so it really goes against the paradigm of health systems to think that far ahead and plan. But you really raise an important point. I mean, so we've had stockpiles for medicines and supplies in the U.S., and some of that came to good use during the pandemic. But otherwise, um, you know, outside of ensuring that our stockpiles are ready and available and they're designed for the modern issues that we're facing today, we also need to share resources. So, for example, during the pandemic, not all cities and hospitals were hit hard at the same time, and some had lacks, they had more resources than others. And having, you know, strategies in place and agreements in place to share those resources, in addition to thinking about how we can do a better job of stockpiling, is going to be really important. You know, I, I understand, say, for example, if, if, if profit is a central motive here, that you want to be as efficient as you can, and you want to sort of maximize shareholder return, or however you want to call it. But at the same time, I also wonder whether... <laughs> you know, isn't there a financial incentive to kind of plan for the rainy day? Meaning, is it still profitable for uh, medical institutions not to plan ahead further? So, you know, in the case of this once in a hundred year pandemic, Harry, absolutely, that had they planned in advance as far as having more equipment for a rainy day or PPE, or many other things that were needed at the end of the day, it would have come handy. And this ended up being an extremely expensive public health emergency for health systems. However, again, I think that the thought process is more behind, you know, the unlikeliness of an event occurring. Uh, and, you know, every time that there's a disaster or public health emergency, it energizes both health systems and policymakers to do something so that we can do better the next time around. And I think some of the important incentives are, one is the patient and communities that we serve that will ultimately suffer in the setting of not planning and also the health system workforce. So that as you know, and, and, and I'm sure the viewers have heard and seen that the workforce, there's major attrition and people are leaving the health system in throes. And part of the better planning and preparedness is to protect our health system because they're truly a national national, not just a national treasure, but also part of the national health security that the, the, the country needs to invest in and do a better job of protecting. Did, did we learn anything from the pandemic? I mean, I remember those horrible stories of essentially the state of California competing with the state of New York for the same finite number of whatever it was, masks and so forth. But uh, here we are in this scenario. Is there a greater amount of collaboration on the ground when you see these drug shortages where uh, if a clinic is running short in a rural area, a, a major metro hospital that might have more is working in, in hand in hand and say, OK, look, uh, you can borrow 50,000 of these today. We know you'll be good for it in a couple of months. You know, we saw some of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that various states, and including in Michigan, where I am right now, 
Uh, some of the hospitals that were not as busy and uh, overwhelmed by COVID patients did accept patients and transfers from other other hospitals in the in the state that were really overwhelmed and, and over capacity. Uh, so th that is one way of, of, of sharing resources. Um, uh, also, for example, uh, sharing some capacity around critical care through uh, telecritical care where, where doctors kind of advise physicians in, in community or remote hospitals around the care of COVID patients. So we saw some of that. But we certainly need policies in place and um, and 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 def more defined strategies to disseminate the importance of collaboration, cooperation during public health emergencies. Uh, you know, you know, more routinely. Uh, so, although, for example, in the United States, there are good examples of that. Uh, it, it's not something that was done, you know, uh, on a routine or regular basis or enough. Recently, a lot of people were uh, made aware of how acute some of these supply chain shortages can be in the context of baby formula. If you had an infant, this was an enormous source of stress for several months. And the administration had to step in. And, and, I, and I wonder if, uh, is there something similar to a Def Defense Production Act sort of um, impetus that an administration can do or uh, uh, members of Congress can do to try to say, Here's the 15 or 25 things we can never be short of in the U.S. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Defense Production Act outside of a public health emergency like COVID uh, will be more difficult to trigger. Uh, however, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, having a list of critical uh, medicines and supplies and equipment uh, that are important to sustaining the work of hospitals and health systems would be really important so that we start by addressing the supply chain issues in the in the context of those priority items. And then over time, once we find the effective strategies and implement them, uh, kind of expand those strategies uh, to, to other items. So I'm giving you a magic wand here. If you could uh, set a prescription for how to fix this, where would you start and what would you tell policymakers? Demand transparency from manufacturers and put patients first. Because at the end of the day, it may be their family member or their loved ones who are in a, in a stretcher in a hospital or ER somewhere needing that medicine that is not available. So I think that in order to create that transparency, we need to identify clear uh, incentives and disincentives uh, to ensure that the manufacturers follow through and so that we have more transparency in, in drug manufacturing and ultimately have the ability to predict bottlenecks and shortages in order to be able to mitigate them ahead of time. Dr. Masha Abir, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.